David Sheridan, CEO and President of R&D Medical here in Lake Forest to share his executive insights on Made in America. Uh, let me get started. We, we are privately held, and as you know, we make everything here in America. It's all manufactured in USA, Lake Forest, California, 100%. We are a contract manufacturer. And what we do is uh, we manufacture medical electrodes. Most people don't know what a contract manufacturer is. A lot of times that happens to me because people will ask me, uh, what's your brand name? And, you know, if you're a contract manufacturer, you don't have a brand. We don't exist. The world doesn't really know we exist because what we do is really either make a component or all the way up to the finished product, even including packaging and sometimes uh, shipping to the customer. And, uh, but what it doesn't have, what it doesn't have on it, it doesn't have our company name. So it has their name on it, and so we'll do everything for them. And that's what a contract manufacturer is. Our, our goal is to make our client famous. Sid, is that you? Uh, you're one of the speakers, right? Oh, Saeed. Saeed, sorry. You know, I, I noticed that you had uh, 2,400 employees. Is that right? Well, you know, I was talking to, to my dad about that, and uh, we were saying, God, and, oh, in fact, my dad's here. By the way, we were saying, you know, I have a 13-year-old daughter, and if I uh, had to help her sell Girl Scout cookies, and if I was you, that wouldn't be much of a challenge, I think. That would, you know, I, I, I was just thinking about that. But uh, anyway, so that's, that's what a uh, contract manufacturer is. We, a lot of times people will say, well, what, what, do you, what do you do? What do you make? And uh, I say, well, we make medical electrodes. And sometimes they'll say, was well, that EKG for your heart? And I said, yeah, we do that, but we do a lot of things. We, we have electrodes for all parts of the body. For example, uh, nerve monitoring. Let me see, how many uh, women in here are incontinent, have to wear diapers? Uh, <laughs> raise your hand or stand up, e either one. <laughs> okay, that product's actually in development, and the, by the demographics I see here, I don't see that that, that market we might not work on. You know? <laughs> I don't know. Well, we're also working on uh, an electrode that goes down in the lower abdomen for uh, PMS. Uh, is anybody, are any women suffering from that? <laughs> Actually, men can raise their hand, too, if you want. Um, uh, those are a couple of products that uh, are related to electrodes. The next one, uh, this is one that we uh, just started working on development recently. It's uh, uh, CEO, Dr. Castell, right there. We're doing, uh, we're starting the early development of dysphagia. That's to monitor people that have <laughs> difficulty swallowing or, or can't swallow. And then uh, another one down here. Let me grab one of the products out. We make a product for, and a lot of you, a lot of you can relate to this, um, bad knees, bad knee trouble. Uh, we make an electrode that goes in the knee for treating osteoarthritis. It's for when someone needs a $60,000 uh, knee replacement and knee surgery. They can actually wear this brace with our electrodes in it. And if they wear it eight hours a day, excuse me, five hours a day for eight months, they pretty much got a, a brand new knee and can withhold or forgo the operation for about 10 to 20 years. So we get to, we get to do some pretty cool stuff. So that's what R&D is about. Now, to the next slide. Uh, why, why do we uh, make products in America? Well, I find making products in America is great. America has a great reputation. This little uh, picture up here, this happens to be uh, me and Dr. Mayer at Arab Health. He, uh, he uses our electrodes in one of his clinics that uh, are bought from one of my clients, Neva Medical out in Finland. And uh, what we find, 
like when we're exhibiting it at these shows, these clients who come up to us, and like when me and Joanne are, are exhibiting in a booth, they'll say, you know, they start talking about us developing a product and we tell them it's made in America. And they ask, well, they want to make sure that we're going to put made in America on it because they know our reputation. Our country has this great integrity that I think is undersold. And, you know, we, we, are, we are watched over by the FDA. And, and the world knows that. You know, you can't buy the FDA. The FDA is not for sale. And uh, so they, they want that reputation. And it's amazing. To, even when I go to Europe, same thing. We get that same kind of response. So just by saying, I manufacture a product in America, I'm 50% ahead of everybody else right away. And like, um, like when Frank and I here, Frank's my patent attorney, um, Frank Ubell. Like when we were in, uh, uh, in uh, Dubai, I mean, you wouldn't believe this. I mean, two guys our age walking into a bar loaded with our heart, heart medication. And man, people just, as soon as they find out we're from America, I mean, people just come to us really quick. It's, it's amazing how much they just, you know, put us, uh, put us high on a pedestal. So we're, we're thought of uh, in, in that regard. We're, we're thought pretty, pretty highly. So with that integrity, that's what America does for me as a manufacturer. And how do I do it? How do I, uh, now that I got all the advantages of making product in America, how am I going to stay here? And here's what we do. We are, uh, we're privately held. Our uh, long-term, we have long-term profit goals. It takes, and I have, and this example right here, uh, this product took us 17 years to get to market. We went through every revision in the alphabet, and it still wasn't working on the patient. If I had been publicly held, or had angel investors, God, they would, have, they would have got rid of us a long time ago. But being that I'm privately held, I can get away with that. I, I can do, I can take on these challenges that are just, just a money pit. But we know that there's, there's light at the end of the tunnel. This is, this is actually what this product looks like. I, I do have a diagram of it up there. It's hard to see. I, we actually put this uh, in, in the patient, but they inserted it into the wrong end of the patient. So that, that photo just didn't work out. And, uh, you know, <laughs> Pilar, she tried to Photoshop it, and it, it just didn't work. So anyway, the diagram is what you get, but I think you can see it just goes down the mouth, and it goes into the esophagus, your intubation. We, uh, we can just take our time, get it done right. We are a contractor manufacturing contractor that uh, connects with our clients. Our client base is not that big. Uh, with the client, we, we suck up a lot of resources in the development phase. So we're pretty picky. We don't take on everybody. We, uh, we find out what the need is. And it, it doesn't have to make economic sense, but it does have to make uh, ethical sense. If we think there's a need out there, we're going to do it. This, this little guy up here, uh, my client, really good client, I've had him for 15 years, he wanted us to develop a, an electrode for a baby that weighs under one pound. Not much of a market for that. But there's babies out there that are one pound. The problem is with normal electrodes, they take up a lot of real estate on the chest. And, and that's just not going to work. So we knew that we're going to throw a lot of money in this. And we're not going to get the money back. But these babies need it. And our client wants it. And we want to we go the distance with our client. It doesn't always make economic sense. But it does make ethical sense. It turns out, though, 
that when they put it on these little guys, some of the people got a little adventurous. They found out, well, let's try putting the electrode on these bigger babies. And it's, it started working out pretty good on the bigger babies. And uh, I'm, not to, I'm not allowed to disclose who I manufacture for. For many clients, they don't want me to, they don't want anybody to know I exist. And that's OK. But we have this one client that we've been working on a negotiation for about three years. And it, it was just finalized. But they said, we want this product. And we want it on all our babies. So they're going to put it in 200 countries. And I'm going to have several thousand people selling this product overnight. I didn't plan it that way. I thought we were going to just make a few. And now we have no idea how many we're going to make. But I hope with that kind of manufacturing cap capacity that we're going to have to pull off, you know, I can return the favor to Jessica for allowing me to come up and speak to you guys. I connect with my clients in other ways. Um, this client here, uh, right below here, this, this French client, very innovative way to do resting ECG electrodes. We can get a much cleaner trace, shorten the time it takes to do a, a resting ECG. And uh, they're a good count. Uh, they're doing really well. It's a nice business. I enjoy this French client. The CEO of that client, he doesn't speak French. I mean, doesn't speak English. Uh, he only speaks French. I decided I'm going to learn French. You know, so now. Me and this guy, Hubert Monnier, uh, we don't talk through an interpreter. Interpret. We talk direct in French. Now, I mess it up pretty bad. You know, I, I don't get the male and female genders right on the verbs. <laughs> My tense on the verb conjugate, conjugation is just really bad. But you know what? He understands what I'm saying. And we can have a drink together, and we can get everything we want to get across without having that third party. I like doing those kind of things. It, it, it puts that bond with my clients, because I'm, I'm going to be with them for the long haul. So that's what being a contract manufacturer is and going down that, that path with them. I, uh, I got some rituals that I uh, do in the morning. Um, I have this really, I, I'm not motivated, for example, to to go to the gym. It just doesn't motivate me. I do go, but I'm just not motivated. But I, I have this very attractive trainer, and she'll, she'll text me a, a picture of her in her new uh, fitness <laughs> outfit and says, would you want to you go to the gym? You know, I will go. I have no problem. I, I will do that. But you know, I can't depend on that all the time. So every morning, I got this little ritual. And, and I love what it is. I love coffee. I want to drink my coffee. I don't want to start a day with that. But my little rule is, I don't start drinking my coffee until I'm in a gym. Once I'm in the gym, I take the first sip. And then I'm rolling, and everything's fine. That gets me through, and that works 365 days a year. Today, it was a little shorter, but I got it done. But after that, when I get home, I, I like to read Proverbs. Just a, uh, just a few verses. Um, that gets me rolling. So I, I got my little coffee. I, I did my gym workout, and I read Proverbs. And, the, and uh, you know, I just put a, a few verses up there just for the heck of it, just some of them. Because what happens during the day is something will happen to me. I'm talking with a client. I'm making a decision with an employee. And something pops in my head and says, you know, that's practical in this instant. And like, I, this is one of my favorite up here. The, the heart of the righteous studies how to answer. Because a lot of times, I get asked a question, and my future, it could be the future I have with that client for the next five, 10 years. I'm going to study that. I'm not going to answer that question right away. I might think about it. So in a lot of ways, my business operates on a Proverbs business model. I have this Asian client that came to us. It's for eyelash extensions. 
that we're working on, we've been doing for quite a few years. By the way, these products, I don't pick these. These come to me. If I'm going to extend a body part, it's not going to be my eyelashes. That's <laughs> way down there. But anyway, this company had come to us. For, uh, their supplier was from China. And what they have, they have a gel that, is, uh, going, that was used, and it's causing a lot of skin irritation problems. And they said, you know, we, we can't handle this anymore. We get one shipment in, in one month, the product is great. Next month, they got irritation problems all over the place. They said, we're done with this. Let's find an American manufacturer. Uh, Chinese patent attorney found me and remade a product for them. And I gave them a quotation. And they said to me, well, you're your price is three times higher than my current supplier. And you know it is. But we have never caused any of their patients any skin problems. So yes, we have a higher price. But we don't have a higher cost. We have a much lower cost. And that's what we tell our people out there. And that's what they find out. Because when they come to us, they do play hardball. They say, you know, we are making things here that are a lot more ex expensive somewhere else. Okay, give me some time. Unfairness, you know, I think a lot of times when I'm negotiating, because I know I'm going to be with these people forever, because once we develop a product together, I mean, we're hooked. It's not like you can go find the, another manufacturer. We're too deep into this. There's too much intellectual pro property that's going to cross paths and get locked in. So. I don't mind in my negotiation if they get the better end of the deal. For me, it's, it's an investment in my future. And this one example I had, you know, with the uh, endotracheal tube that went down the wrong end, with that product in development, we just lost money, a lot of money. But once it took off and it started doing well, one day my clients had a trade show, we're talking. And it's now in, it's in production. We're making money. Actually, we're making good money. And I'm thinking, well, maybe we're making too much money. And I tell them, I said, you know, we've automated this a lot since the volume's gone up. And I can lower your price. And Dr. Ray says, no, I like the price the way it is. You know, it took 15 years to bounce back that way. But it, he doesn't mind. So it's a, it's a nice trade-off to develop the strong relationships. I did fairness. We can move on. Uh, connecting with my employees. A lot of my employees, well, not a lot, but a few of my team came here today. And, and what do I do? I, uh, I let my core management team be the captain of their own ship. I let them make their decisions. I don't get involved in the small pocket chain stuff, you know? I, I hear them out. And uh, I've had my team a long time. I've had everybody on my core team I've known for at least 10 years. Most of them have worked for me at least 10 years. And some I've known for 20 years, 25 years, maybe a couple 27. But uh, I let them be the decision makers. When I come to work after I've done my gym workout and I'm totally relaxed, sometimes they're there and things just haven't worked out for them. And I've had a lot of two-hour conversations with one of my employees, and I didn't say a word in that whole two hours. So it, it works. I, I, I like it that way. We put up here, you know, I put this uh, Rolex watch up there because, um, you know, I had, I had a really good time one day. I went to go buy a, I spent, I think, thirteen, fifteen thousand dollars $15,000 on this Rolex watch. And uh, I, wanted to, I wanted to give it to an employee because she hadn't missed a day. She had been working at this company, my company, for 10 years. And she didn't miss a day of work. It's fun 
to give somebody a $15,000 watch when they don't miss a day of work. I, as, a, as an employer, I didn't think people like that existed out there. But, you know, when you get to be an employer and you find those people and you go, where do, the, where do these people come from? But they're, but they're out there. I give my team a, a piece of the pie. They see the financials. They see all of it. I don't hide anything from them because they know a piece of that is theirs. And I never have to watch over them because that's theirs. What they do with their uh, 40 hours, 50 hours a week, whatever it takes, that's all up to them. That's their own challenge. If they do it right, it's going to work out. We have no plans to sell. I don't want to change the management style. I don't want someone to come in and buy my company and realize that he can make this same product that I'm making now for a client and go make it for another client, the same thing, and they can go out in the world and bump into each other. Good business sense. We'll make a lot more money. But I, that's not what I want to do. I, I, I want to partner up with my client. So I don't want to change that. And I'm afraid if I sold the company, I would have to change that. I want to keep that culture. I don't want to see a new CEO come in and say, you know, we can really cut our costs if we move some of this manufacturing to a low cost producing country. Sure, I'm going to make more money. But what job is my daughter, my 13-year-old daughter, going to do 20 years down the road? What am I going to do for her? So I'm not selling. I decided, I defined what failure was. I decided that if I'm breathing, I'm successful. So I may succeed very, very bad, but as long as there was air going into my lungs, I said I didn't fail. That's my uh, management experience. I don't know why she left this in here, but maybe I told her to. It says die in the afternoon. You know what that means? And I've told this to you, Frank, and I've told it to a uh, few other people, and especially my team. I, uh, I want to die in the afternoon so I can at least get a half a day's work done. <laughs> you know? I, I love what I do. You know, it's in the morning, if, I, if on my last day, I'd like to call Frank. I'd like to talk to you, and we can talk about the next patent we're working on, or you could help me with some intellectual property. Or Joanna, I could talk to you and say, hey, uh, by the way, Joanna's the girl that got the Rolex watch. Um, I could uh, say, Joanna, it's time for you to take over some of my projects because I'm pretty much shutting down around two. You know, get that out of the way. If I have a little extra time in the day, you know, I may do something personal. I may cancel my Botox appointment. You know, I, I may put my Viagra on Craigslist. You know, but pretty much, I, I'm done. I'm done for the show. I'm ready to get in the fine box, and that's that's my show.